Hello, I am Dr. Ron Trailer, and this is History 476, and this is video number five. All right, we ended video number four. Uh, we had just started our discussion of the events that led up to the Missouri Compromise. So let's continue with that topic today. <clears throat> we, without going into any great repetitive detail, um, it just happened to work out that by uh, 1819, uh, there were equal numbers of slave states and free states, uh, which meant that uh, there were uh, equal number of uh, U.S. senators who represented slave states and uh, an equal number of U.S. senators who represented it, who represented free states. And uh, it was the desire of most people to maintain that balance. Well, in 1819, uh, Missouri uh, applied for statehood, uh, and they wanted to be a slave state. And of course, that would have upset the, the balance of power between the free and the slave states. And so um, it was uh, decided that uh, as Missouri came into the Union as a slave state, that Maine would come into the Union as a free state. Now, Maine, uh, since colonial period, had been fundamentally the northern province or the northern county, if you will, of uh, the state of Massachusetts. Uh, and so uh, everyone thought that this would be a, a, a really fine way to solve the problem of maintaining balance. Uh, bring in Missouri as a slave state, bring in Maine as a free state. Now, uh, the statehood for both of those uh, uh, for those areas, both Missouri and Maine, uh, were combined together in the same bill that was introduced into the Congress. Clay, uh, Speaker of the House Clay, spoke in favor of the bill and worked unceasingly for its passage. Uh, the Senate linked Maine's request for separate statehood to that of Missouri in order to maintain the, numer the numerical balance between slave and free states that we've been discussing. Now, back when the western boundary of the United States was the Mississippi River. Um, it was uh, it was no problem uh, to uh, control whether prospective states would come into the Union as free or slave. For example, we've already said that uh, uh, in the seven in the late seventeen hundreds, uh, while the Articles of Confederation were still in effect. The Northwest Ordinance had uh, said that no state that was carved out of the old Northwest would be permitted to enter the Union as a slave state, and that the institution of slavery itself would never be permitted to exist in that area. And remember, we said that five states were eventually carved from the old Northwest Territory, uh, and they entered the Union, and they entered the Union as free states in which slavery did not exist. Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, uh, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Now, the issue of the spread of slavery, the expansion of slavery uh, played an important role in the Missouri Compromise of 1819. Uh, look at a map. I don't have a map to show you, uh, but maps are readily available. Um, Missouri was permitted to enter 
the Union as a slave state. But um, the Congress then drew a line uh, at the southern border of Missouri, the southern border of Missouri, which is the same thing as the northern border of Arkansas. And then they extended that line, that east-west line, they extended that line all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And they ruled that in the future, that no uh, slave states would be permitted to exist north of that line. Right? North of that line, the southern boundary of Missouri, the northern boundary of Arkansas, Slavery would never be permitted to, to exist uh, north of that line ever again. Now, what that really meant was that there was a lot of what becomes the United States that is off limits to slavery. Um, why do you think that the southern states acquiesced. Why do you think that they agreed with the creation of that line that banned slavery from much of the North American continent? Well, it was it's very simple. Um, the much of the area of the uh, the states, for example, of Kansas and Nebraska and the Dakotas, Colorado. Those places were uh, referred to quite often back in those days as the Great American Desert. The Great American Desert. Uh, many people, north and south, uh, were of the opinion that that country was fit only for Indians and buffalo. That, uh, that it was a, a rather arid region not a desert, but arid, uh, although they called it the Great American Desert. People then looked at that country and decided that it would never be fit for anything, now, uh, mostly because of its lack of water. Now, why? No, not why. They knew, right? They knew uh, that there was never going to be enough water uh, applied to that land in order to make it really productive. Um, and they cert you certainly couldn't grow crops that required a lot of water. Tobacco and cotton and sugar cane and rice. No. What did those crops also have in common? They need a lot of water, but what do they also have in common? They are the most important southern crops. So, uh, even the southern people uh, were willing to admit that no southern crops could ever be grown in this great American desert simply because there was not enough water available. And as a result, they didn't really argue when much of that land was put off limits to the institution of slavery because they were convinced that slavery would never be able to exist there because the crops that needed slave labor to exist couldn't exist. And so, um, now, what's interesting about that entire thing story is that later when the technology became perfected to pump water out of the ground out of what's referred to as the aquifer this land became extraordinarily productive land as a matter of fact this land kansas and nebraska and the dakotas and colorado this land no longer is known as the Great American Desert, what, what do people start to call it? This, they start to call it the breadbasket of America. This is where, and still today, this is where most of America's grains 
are raised. Uh, corn, uh, wheat, barley, rye. So, uh, maybe, um, but because uh, the knowledge base was not as well developed then as it is now, Everyone just assumed that this land was going to be worthless and would be worthless forever, but not so. But by that time, that line had been drawn, hadn't it, on the southern boundary of the state of Missouri all the way to the, to the Pacific Ocean, and slavery could no longer legally exist north of that line. The Missouri Compromise uh, passed through the Congress uh, in uh, on the second day of March of 1820. Um, and President Monroe signed it into law uh, on March the 6th. So the Missouri Compromise was in place. Uh, what, once again, what was the purpose of the Missouri Compromise? It was to maintain a balance between the slave states and the free states. More specifically, to maintain a balance between the numbers of U.S. senators from slave states and the number of U.S. senators from free states. Now, once the Missouri Compromise was in place, another problem arose. Most slavery forces in Missouri attempted to write into the new state constitution a provision that banned free blacks and mulattoes from residing in the state. Now, what is a mulatto? Well, it's a, a person of mixed race, normally uh, mixed African and Caucasian heritage. Um, there had always been uh, an animosity against free people of color, because uh, free people of color, by their very nature, were not slaves, but they certainly were black. And whites, many whites, especially white uh, slave, the, uh, the, the, slave, the white slave owners of slaves, uh, felt um, challenged by the mere existence of a black man who was not a slave, but who was free. Because the free people of color, although they did not have all of the rights of a white man, they had many of the rights of a white man. And therefore, uh, many whites uh, felt that the easiest way to solve the free people of color problem was to expel them for there not to be any of them. Um, and uh, with regard to the mulattoes, many of the free people of color were in fact mulattoes, people of mixed race. Now, um, pro-slavery forces in Missouri, uh, as they were writing the, the let me back up. One of the things that had to be done before Missouri could come into the Union as a state was they had to not only write a new state constitution, but they had to submit it to the Congress, and the Congress had to go over it and had to find it satisfactory. Uh, once the Congress approved of the new constitution, uh, then uh, the uh, the entrance of the new state into the Union could continue. As the Missouri as the Missouri uh, Constitution was being written, these pro-slavery people in Missouri, those who supported the institution of slavery, uh, tried to insert into this new constitution that they were writing, uh, a provision that banned free blacks and mulattoes from living in Missouri. This was a clear violation of Article 4, Section 2 of 
the Constitution of the United States. The quote is, the citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the other state. Well, free blacks were citizens, um, and yet the pro-slavery faction in Missouri was trying to deprive them um, of certain of their rights. The most obvious one was being able to live where they chose to live. Now, this new controversy threatened the final approval of the Missouri uh, entrance into the Union because uh, the, uh, the Congress, there was a very good chance that the Congress was not going to approve statehood for Missouri because of these problems, the problems that had arisen now dealing with the free blacks and the mulattoes. At this point, Henry Clay enters the picture again. Remember, Henry Clay is the uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives. Clay created what we quite often refer to as a second Missouri Compromise. And what he said was, that the admission of Missouri into the Union would require assurance <coughs> of the Missouri legislature that although that clause would remain in the Constitution, the clause that said mulattoes have to go and free people of color have to go, even though it would remain officially as a part of the Constitution, it would never be used to officially deny the privileges of those two groups. It was Clay's reasoning that Missouri legislators uh, who, when sworn into office, took as part of their oath swearing allegiance to the U.S. Constitution, which took precedence over any other part of the state constitution. Uh, it was a... Uh, clever way to get around the problem. Furthermore, Clay said that uh, he really strongly felt that if, Missouri, if the Missouri legislator uh, enacted laws that conflicted with the U.S. Constitution, they would be struck down by the courts anyway. So uh, Clay was arguing that it doesn't matter if you put something that's unconstitutional into the Constitution, into the state Constitution that it's not going to be permitted to stand. Now, repeated debate uh, follows all of this. Um, but the bottom line is that the Missouri Compromise passed uh, through the House uh, by a rather close vote, 87 to 81, but all they needed was a simple majority. Um, and so, and the Senate passed it shortly thereafter. And so, on August the 10th, 1820, by the way, you don't have to remember these specific dates, the day and the month, but you, I would like for you to remember that this is all what the year was, right? 1820. On August the 10th, 1820, Monroe declared that Missouri was a state. Now, everybody gives credit, uh, gives Clay the credit for the first compromise. His role in the second Compromise. Even the existence of the second Missouri Compromise is unknown to many students. Uh, I can't. I can't tell you how many of my students, uh, history majors, social studies majors, come to me after this lecture and they say, "I I knew about the Missouri Compromise, but I didn't know there were two of them." Well, yes, yes, there were. All right. Now, if you recall, uh, during the previous lecture, I realized that I'd sort of got ahead of myself and I went back in time, uh, picked up things like the Missouri Compromise 
I've brought it forward. Now, I think that everything is correct. I think everything is right. Now, I think that the time order is back to being correct. All right. Now, let's talk about the expansion and the growth of America. America was undergoing a major transformation, both economically and socially, during the era of Andrew Jackson. Remember, Jackson is elected in the election of 1828, and he takes office uh, in March of 1829. So we can mark the year 1829 as the beginning of the Jacksonian era. The Industrial Revolution was already beginning to, uh, to reshape the American economy. Um, and a, a movement toward urbanization, in other words, the creation of large cities, was already beginning. Agriculture, especially in the western part of the country. Now, where was the west? We've got to be careful here. It's not California. It's uh, the states that are along the Mississippi River. Those are the ones that are furthest west, including the new state of Missouri. Now, agriculture in the West, in that area, uh, was becoming more and more based on corn and wheat and cattle. Those were the, the prime movers of uh, the economy in the Western part of the nation. In the South, cotton uh, had already become king. It was not becoming king, it was king. Um, and the uh, cultivation of cotton was becoming even more and more and more dependent upon unfree labor. In other words, slavery. Improvements in transportation, such as uh, the digging of canals, like Erie Canal, um, the perfection of steamboats, the introduction of railroads, uh, were creating national markets uh, that before too long were maturing into international markets. If you could get fruits and vegetables from where they were grown to where they were going to be sold, and if you could do it quickly enough to where the produce doesn't spoil, that's a good thing for the economy, isn't it? Now, for many years, I've, I've mentioned this, but I would like to go into just a little bit more detail. For many years, cotton was rare and very expensive because of the hand labor that was required to separate the fiber from uh, the seed. And that changed in the 1790s when the cotton gin, which, by the way, is a shortened version of the word engine, cotton gin, cotton engine. Um, so let's talk about uh, that transition. Prior to the perfection of the cotton gin, cotton was not an important crop. The important crops were things like tobacco. Uh, rice, uh, sugar cane, uh, to a lesser degree, uh, lesser degree, indigo, which was a, a naturally occurring dye that produced a beautiful uh, bluish, purplish, reddish <laughs> natural dye. It is, I've read, that it literally took one really good slave uh, an entire day, and that probably means 12 hours of work, uh, to pluck the cotton seed out of one 
pound of cotton fiber. And so you can see now what is what is the one of the fundamental laws of economics. If a thing is scarce, the price of that thing, whatever that thing is, the price of that thing is going to go up. Well, there was not a lot of cotton fiber. There was not a lot of seed free cotton fiber available. Which means that there was not a lot of fabric being woven out of cotton because uh, there was not that uh, much cotton fiber to use to uh, to weave into into cloth as a result cotton cloth did exist but it was so rare that it was also expensive and the result was that very few people, except really wealthy people, could afford to wear clothing made of cotton. Now, I'm sitting here in my office on campus recording this lecture. And uh, now I do have a heavy wool, right? Heavy wool jacket on. Uh, and by the way, I'm regretting already wearing <laughs> this thing today. But the rest of my clothing is almost exclusively made from cotton. My socks, my underwear, uh, my pants are all made from either pure cotton or some type of a cotton blend. That was not the case in the late 1700s. Uh, most people wore, uh, only the wealthy could afford to wear clothing made of cotton. Most of the rest of us uh, wore clothing that was made out of wool or linen, both of which were really hot and really uncomfortable uh, fabrics. But what can you do? Uh, if there's not much cotton fiber, and if the clothing made from that limited amount of cotton fiber uh, is expensive, then you wear what you can. Now, in the early 1790s, uh, the cotton gin, now, perfect, perfecting a machine that would separate the cotton seed from the cotton fiber had been a dream for, well, forever. But no one had been able to do it until the 1790s. Um, when a man by the name of Eli Whitney uh, is given the credit for perfecting that first work, workable, working cotton gin. Now, here's an interesting story, uh, and I can only say that uh, there are tantalizing hints in the historical records that this may be true, but we can't take it to the bank. Further research is probably going to be necessary story, the accepted story, is that Eli Whitney, uh, a white man, affected the cotton gin. But the back story is that it was actually one of Eli Whitney's slaves who perfected the cotton gin. And so, uh, if you are uh, one of my black students uh, watching this lecture, you probably should have mixed emotions. You should be proud of the fact uh, that it that, that the story says that it was a African who uh, was finally the first one to perfect the cotton gin. But you can also be very sad because uh, cotton cultivation was not that common back in those days for all the reasons that I've talked about, including the, uh, the, the rarity of the cotton fiber. Because once the cotton gin, whoever perfected it, right? once the cotton gin was perfected, guess what happened to the cultivation of cotton? It just skyrocketed. There was this tsunami, this, this tidal wave. Everybody and their uncle Across the South, uh, if if the climate permitted cotton to be grown, uh, 
cotton began to be grown, and cotton did become the king. Uh, the entire southern economy uh, would come to be based on how sad, how ironic it would be if the story is true. Uh, that an African man, uh, a slave man of Eli Whitney, uh, was actually the person who perfected uh, the cotton gin. Because the cotton gin permitted a lot more seed to be removed from the fiber. Uh, as much as, as many as 50 times more uh, seed could be uh could be removed from uh, the fiber. And so you can see that um, the cultivation of cotton would, would, would explode. Cotton production soared during the first half of the 19th century, the first half of the 1800s. Um, and it had a huge impact on American history in ways that, that we don't really think about too often, but I would ask you to think about these things. The perfection of the cotton gin encouraged westward migration. Now, uh, at one time, the southern states fundamentally were Virginia, Maryland, North and South Carolina, and Georgia. Uh, if you want to, if you want to be really picky, you could probably throw Louisiana in there too. Uh, states in the early part of the uh, of the nineteenth century. But when the cotton gin was perfected. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry wanted to become a cotton grower. And what that means is that slave owners, cotton growers who were slave owners, and their slaves migrated westward in a search for cotton land. Cotton becomes not just a major export commodity for the United States, it becomes the major export commodity for the United States. I think I told you uh, in a previous lecture that it was not until the year 1900 that the uh, value, that the uh, export value of cotton was finally exceeded by the export value of manufactured goods. Between the mid-1830s and 1860, the beginning of the Civil War, cotton represented more than half of all U.S. exports to other nations around the world. Uh, the North uh, prospered because of the cotton trade, because not only was the South exporting uh, cotton to other nations of the world, especially England, but the South was also uh, sending uh, cotton to northern textile mills. So uh, the uh, the appetite for northern fabric factories, textile factories, uh, was insatiable. It was just eating all the cotton that it could be sent to it. And the profits that were generated by these northern textile mills uh, provided for uh, provided capital, in other words, excess cash for northern businessmen and northern industrialists that helped the growth of non cotton type businesses as well. So everybody was profiting uh, off cotton with the obvious sad exception of the people who were actually uh, cultivating the cotton. And of course, that means African slaves.
I mentioned westward expansion a few moments ago. By the year 1860, more than half of the United States population lived west of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, and that had not always been true. Uh, there was a time, for example, in 1790, when the first U.S. census was conducted, uh, most Americans still, li still lived in the original 13 colonies, or now the original 13 states, that were located east of the Appalachian Mountain. Uh, 70 years later, in 1860, more than half of all Americans lived west of the Appalachian Mountain. And in addition to that, the West Coast, the Pacific Coast, was already being settled. Uh, California. Uh, have you ever wondered why the San Francisco 49ers are called the San Francisco 49ers? It's a reference to uh, the year in which many, many, many uh, people came from other parts of the United States and other parts of the world came to California because gold had been discovered uh, in California. The California gold rush. And so fundamentally, um, initially, the United States had been settled uh, beginning in the east and heading toward the west. But with the discovery of gold in California, uh, the settlement from the east toward the west continued, but now people were, were coming into North America, uh, into California on the west coast first, and then they were settling, they were heading east. And so what happens is that people coming from the east, people come from the west, and they meet somewhere in the middle. It was a unique settlement pattern. Now, there were a lot of changes in agriculture and in land usage during these general times as well. Uh, for example, in 1819, something happened that we don't probably really appreciate today as much as we should appreciate it. In the year 1819, um, a plow with rep with replaceable iron parts uh, was perfected. Now, what? Why in the world does Doctor Trailer say that that's important? Well, prior to this, plows were wooden. Uh, people were plowing the ground with wooden plows, just as they had in the previous thousands of years. Really. Really primitive. Uh, that wooden plow uh, broke easily. It couldn't really bite into the soil to turn the soil over um, uh, and make the soil crumbly to where you could really plant crops in the ground. And now uh, a plow with a replaceable iron uh, teeth on it. All right. uh, uh, if something broke, you didn't have to replace the entire plow. You just replaced the broken. And you replaced it not with a wooden part, but with a metal part. And of course, a metal part could be sharpened. Uh, and it was much more effective and much more uh, efficient. The real change. Now, now that was a that was a uh, that was a wooden plow that had small metal parts to it. It was still a huge improvement, but the really big improvement was yet to come. Because in 1837, a man by the name of John Deere invented a steel plow. Now it was still a wooden plow with steel parts, but the steel but it had uh, uh, the steel part of it um, uh, uh, took up much more of the plow than the old wooden plow with the small steel parts. John Deere invented the steel plow in 1837, um, just in time, actually, it worked out beautifully. Uh, it appears just in time for 
breaking the virgin soils of the Great Plains. Remember, we said that those places like Kansas and Nebraska and the Dakotas and Colorado, right, um, that had been considered the Great American Desert, uh, were eventually turned into what we still call the breadbasket of America, and much of the uh, much of the ability to cultivate that land uh, came about because John Deere uh, uh, perfected that steel plow, mostly steel plow, uh, the right place at the right time. Now, the United States eventually would own the land all the way from the Atlantic to the Pacific, all right, all the way from sea to shining sea. Most of the land uh, that came into the possession of the United States in the 19th century uh, was in the Western, what we consider the the true Western, the modern Western part of our country. Now, um, in the period of the 1700s and the early 1800s, uh, when states came into the nation, um, the land... Uh, was owned by the states themselves, and the states had control over what would be done to the land, how it could be sold, and, and things like that. But in the latter part of the 19th century, and then into the 20th century, all of that land now belonged, when, when the state came into the Union, uh, it brought its land with it, but the land was not owned by the state, the land was owned by the federal government. And so the federal government now had control uh, over this huge, huge uh, amounts of land, millions and millions and millions of acres. And it was decided, after much debate, it was decided that um, the United States government would try to make it easy for people to buy some of this land. As a matter of fact, uh, sometimes it really, uh, the United States government gave the land away for free. Uh, the only thing that the owner had to do was to promise uh, that he would improve the land, that he would cultivate the land, that he would uh, build houses on it, uh, that he would build barns, that he would build fences, that he, he would improve the land. And after a certain period of time, if he kept that promise, then the, the title of the land would come to him free and clear. Uh, I have elk hunted in Colorado uh, and in Wyoming for years and years and years. And uh, the, the owners of the land on which I have hunted both have the same story to tell. Uh, they, uh, their ancestors came to Colorado or Wyoming. Uh, in the latter part of the 1800s, uh, and they settled on government land, um, and they worked it, and they improved it, and at some point, they received title to it. Uh, some people consider that to be free land. I don't. Uh, these people worked their fingers to the bone uh, in order to improve that land uh, to get it. So uh, let, let's not say it was free. Uh, it was literally blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, maybe, maybe they didn't pay for it with cash, but they certainly paid for it with blood, sweat, and tears. But the, the, uh, the issue became uh, everyone understood that the land was going to be sold to the settlers. But the... The thing that it was not quite settled yet uh, was, will the land uh, be sold in big chunks, many acres, for just a few dollars an acre? Uh, will it be, uh, uh, will it cost 
will it cost more per acre? And you can't you can't uh, uh, buy as many acres. All right? Uh, the land law of 1820, for example, uh, said that uh, you had to buy at least 160 acres of land from the federal government. Um, well, let me let me restate that. Prior to the year 1820, if you wanted to buy federal land in the western states, you had to buy at least 160 acres. But the land law of 1820 reduced the size of the farm, uh, the mandatory minimum size of the farm from 160 acres down to 80 acres. And 80 acres was a much more manageable chunk of land. 160 acres, that's a lot of land. Um, and if you've only got, if you, if, if it's you and it's your wife and it's two children, four people, four people can't really work 160 acres of land, but they, they'll have an easier time of working half that of 80 acres. Uh, plus the price per acre began to drop. Now, remember, you're still buying land from the federal government. You're not buying land from a private owner. Uh, the owner is the United States government, but the settlers could now uh, get 80 acres uh, for a dollar and 25 cents per acre, so they could get literally 80 acres for a hundred dollars. Um, and most people could afford that. Uh, and even if you didn't have a hundred dollars to put down to to pay uh, pay off the land, you could get attractive mortgages uh, and pay it off uh, over a period of time. We have said several times, and let me say it again, that uh, transportation uh, was really poor uh, in the latter part of the 1700s and even into the early part of the 1800s. Remember, we talked about that first national road uh, that ran from the state of, from the, basically the Atlantic Ocean in Maryland all the way over to Ohio, eventually. Uh, there was another one of these uh, early roads uh, that was created in 1795. It was called the Wilderness Road. It followed a path that had been blazed by Daniel Boone 20 years earlier in 1770, uh, 1775, when we were still uh, a colony of England. The, the Wilderness Road by 1795 had, it was still a really primitive. I mean, you know, there were stump holes you could lose a stagecoach in. But nevertheless, it had been open to wagon and stagecoach traffic uh, through the Cumberland Gap into uh, the state of the states of Tennessee and into the state of Ohio, opening up those two states for further uh, settlement and further development. And there, there were very few such roads in the remainder of the South. Most of the decent roads, or even the bad roads for that sake, for that, uh, for that matter, uh, were located in the North, um, or uh, at least were uh, near the Ohio River. The South always lagged <laughs> behind the rest of the nation in road building, internal improvements, we've learned to call them now. Uh, why is it that the Southerners did not uh, actively seek uh, help by the federal government, especially in building these roads. Well, it's very simple. There were already, God had put a lot of navigable streams in the South. Uh, if you lived in most parts of the South, you could get from part from point A to point B without using a road. All you had to do was be able to get to the nearest navigable river. And once you launched your boat or your raft or your barge, uh, 
uh, onto the river, <clears throat> you could go pretty much anywhere. I mean, think about here in southeast Louisiana. Think of the navigable streams uh, that we still enjoy here. And we're not talking about the Mississippi River. That one's too obvious. But think about the smaller ones. Um, how about the Amit River, a navigable stream all the way to Lake Marpaul. Um, the Tickfall, the same deal, navigable all the way to Lake Marpaul. Uh, the Natalbany. The Natalbany empties into the Tickfall, which empties into Lake Marpaul, which empties into Lake Pontchartrain, which empties into the Gulf of Mexico. You see how this works? So, uh, navigable rivers, streams, and lakes really took the place of uh, roads, uh, and many fe uh, people felt that uh, investing in road building was a waste of time and money because they could get where they want to go. It might not be as convenient. It might not be as direct, but it was certainly a lot cheaper uh, than to invest money in uh, road building and in bridge building. Now, in the North, people there had different attitudes toward, towards road building. Um, some of the early pretty good roads in America uh, were located in the, some of the northern states. For example, um, the Pennsylvania Turnpike uh, was already being built by uh, 1821 uh, and many places even earlier than that. By 1821, as a matter of fact, there were more than 4,000 miles of improved gravel roads, okay? We're not talking about concrete, and we're certainly not talking about asphalt, but we are talking about well-drained uh, gravel roads with drainage ditches, not just dirt, gravel roads. That's uh, quite the improvement. By 1821, there were more than 4,000 miles of these turnpikes. Now, a turnpike generally is a toll road. And this is one of the reasons why the roads were pretty good roads. Uh, in order to use the road, you had to pay to use the road. And the tolls then, uh, a certain portion of the toll, was reinvested in the highway company to maintain the high quality of the road and to expand the number of road miles. Uh, my oldest daughter lives near Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, and when I go to visit her, uh, there is a, a system, a pretty good a system, of pretty good roads up there in the uh, eastern part of the state uh, that are. Uh, the roads are owned by the Indian tribes in that portion of Oklahoma. Uh, and they are four-lane superhighways, just like I-10 or I-12. Now, once turnpike travelers, right, on these toll roads, once they reach the Ohio River, now, Look at a map, please, and you'll notice that the Ohio River starts in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and it runs generally in a southwesterly direction. And it runs into the Mississippi River near the present day city of St. Louis, Missouri. So. Uh, if you were traveling on one of these turn, turnpikes uh, and you reached the Ohio River at any point, what you did then, you transferred all your stuff uh, from the wagon. Uh, you transferred your stuff from the wagon uh, to a boat or a barge or a raft, and you continued your voyage by water. Now. There were any number of water craft that could be used. Let's talk about them uh, individually. 
Uh, one way to travel by water was by a flatboat. Um, a flatboat was generally made of boards uh, that had been nailed together or uh, were held together by wooden pegs. But in any case, it's a wooden boat. Uh, you uh, you build the boat yourself. Uh, you load your stuff on the boat. You launch the boat. Uh, and away the boat goes, downstream. Uh, people use them to transport crops. They use them to transport people. Um, and when you got to where you wanted to go, uh, you dragged the flat boat out of the water and you tore it apart. And then you sold the lumber, which was very valuable in those times because Good solid lumber was hard to find. It was the chief method of transportation um, on the Ohio and the Mississippi River, as well as other secondary rivers, but especially those two rivers, the Ohio, the Ohio uh, and the Mississippi River. Now, there was a problem, of course. The boat could only go downstream. It was at the mercy of the current. So it could only go downstream, and it could only go as fast as the current. Oh, I suppose that you could kill yourself with oars trying to, uh, to make it a little faster, but generally people didn't even try. They just passively let the current of the river carry them south. Now, there were also rafts. Uh, which were the first cousin of the flatboats, except the rafts were not made of uh, lumber. They were simply made of logs that were held together, that were nailed together, fastened together somehow. But the whole idea was very similar. Uh, you could, whatever you wanted to, to move by water could be uh, moved by the raft. Once again, you could only go downstream. Once again, you were at the mercy of the current. You couldn't go it much faster than the speed of the current. And then came a fellow by the name of Robert Fulton. Uh, in 1830, um, uh, I'm sorry, by the 1820s, inquisitive men. Now, the steam engine had already been uh, invented. It was still primitive, uh, but the steam engine had already been uh, invented. What it took, though, was to uh, marry, if you will, to combine a boat with a steam engine. This is something that nobody thought about for the longest time. But Robert Fulton uh, was is given the credit for creating the first workable steam boat. It was called the Claremont, C-L-E-R-M-O-N-T. Um, and once people saw the Claremont uh, and realized what a wonderful improvement it was, it didn't take long for uh, the rivers of, and streams of North America to be full, it seemed, of steam boats. By 1836, there were as many as 360 steamboats navigating uh, on uh, the western waters of our country. Now, there were some benefits to a steamboat. Uh, first of all, not only did they go downstream, but they could also go upstream. And this was a wonderful thing. Uh, they were not at the mercy of the speed of the current. They could go faster than the current. The steamboat literally was responsible for creating a continental market in the United States. Uh, and it turned the Midwest into the, the acknowledged breadbasket of America. Uh, villages and streams, uh, villages and towns popped up 
uh, wherever a steamboat went, steamboats needed fuel, whether it was wood or whether it was coal. Um, and uh, the people along the river uh, saw an opportunity to make a profit, and they began to provide the fuel for the steamboats. And so the captains would stop periodically and renew their fuel. And quite often, what started off as just a small fueling stop uh, over a period of time turned into a little village, which in time turned into a little town, which in time turned into a pretty good sized city. No, it didn't do all of it. N not all of them did that, but enough of them did uh, to where you can, you can make the claim that there was a pattern established. Um, and the existing cities, uh, enjoyed phenomenal growth. Uh, one is right down uh, is right down uh, I five from us, and that's the city of New Orleans. The city of New Orleans was already there. You know, it had been created by the the French and then the Spanish uh, before uh, Louisiana ever became a uh, a state. But uh, New Orleans during the 1830s and the 1840s, which is fundamentally the period we're talking about right now became the largest port in the entire United States, even larger sometimes than New York City. That's a good place to stop. That's an hour and a minute. Uh, we will pick up. Uh, that will be the end of video five, and we'll pick up then with video six.